In the year 70 AD, Roman legions sacked and burned Jerusalem. Israel would remain a nation in exile for nearly 2,000 years. But in the aftermath of World War II, the people of the book returned home. Israel's rebirth and survival in the 20th century has often been called a miracle. Those who were there cite their own experiences as proof. I'm Michael Greenspan. I'm an investigative journalist. These are their stories. If your definition of miracles is limited as mine was to parting of the Red Sea and the walls of Jericho falling at the sound of singing kinds of stories, you'll probably not find many miracles here or anywhere else. I've come to realize that some miracles are so big they can't be measured by a single moment or a spectacular event, only by looking back at the sweep of history and realizing there had to be more at work than simply good luck or smart people to achieve what has occurred. That's the kind of story I'm exploring today. In my investigation of miracles in Israel, I've often been told that one of the greatest miracles is that of the ingathering of the Jewish people from around the world to recreate Israel as a sovereign nation after more than 2,000 years in exile. It didn't seem like a miracle to me at first until I took a look for myself. When the Roman Empire engulfed Europe and the Middle East, the Jews of Palestine, already under the yoke of Persia, rebelled in a final desperate struggle to regain their freedom and independence. In response, Roman legions under Titus in 70 AD sacked and burned Jerusalem, killed or enslaved the Jews of Palestine, and banished them from ever returning on pain of death. The Hebrew nation was no more. The people of the book were scattered to the ends of the earth, as far east as China and Japan, to Egypt, Iraq, throughout the African continent, west to Europe, and eventually across the seas to North and South America. In country after country, they established communities and built new lives for themselves. They built synagogues to celebrate their faith and schools to teach their children, keeping alive the memories of the land of David and the glories of Israel. Their prayers and their greetings to one another began to include the familiar phrase, next year in Jerusalem. With a sense of Jewish mission to contribute to the world where God has placed you, they infused their skills and talents into the cultures of their new homelands. Their contributions in science, education, the arts and professions advanced their host societies and literally changed history. Some of the names are very familiar. Leonardo da Vinci, painter Marc Chagall, Albert Einstein, Chaim Weizmann, inventor of TNT that changed the outcome of World War I, and later Israel's first president, Jonas Salk, who discovered the cure for polio, architect gurus Albert Kahn and Frank Gehry, composers Johann Strauss, George Gershwin, and the legendary Irving Berlin, who gave us the songs God Bless America and White Christmas, Leonard Bernstein and Aaron Copeland, authors J.D. Salinger, Neil Simon and Isaac Asimov, actors Cary Grant and Paul Newman, film directors Steven Spielberg and Stanley Kubrick, fashion designers Ralph Lauren and Donna Karan, Levi Strauss, who made jeans the quintessential dress of the modern world, economist Alan Greenspan, track star Harold Abrams of Chariots of Fire fame, baseball's legendary Sandy Koufax, gold medal swimming legend Mark Spitz, and Sydney Olympics champion Lenny Kraselberg. Collectively, Jews have earned more than 20% of all the Nobel Prizes ever awarded, though they are less than one five-hundredth of the world's population. 
In modern times, enterprising Jews founded thousands of companies, among them Home Depot, Dell Computers, RCA, Hershey's Chocolates, the Neiman Marcus Stores, CBS Television, Motion Picture Studios MGM, Paramount Pictures, and the list goes on and on. And yet, throughout history, in country after country, the Jews faced ostracism, rejection, persecution, even death. Not for what they said or did, but for what they believed, for who they were, because they were Jews. But their rejection only fueled the fires of Jewish yearning to return to the homeland that was but a dream for 2,000 years. The founders of modern Israel declared the Jewish homeland a reality on May 14, 1948, and immediately issued a clarion call to all Jews everywhere to come home. And they have. In 1950, the law of return granted every Jew from anywhere in the world the right to immigrate to Israel and become a citizen. Within three years of Israel's birth, nearly 700,000 Jews came here, many of them Holocaust survivors from Germany, Austria, Italy, most of the Jewish communities of Bulgaria and Poland, one-third of the Jews of Romania, nearly all of the Jews in Libya, Yemen, Iraq, soon followed by those in Morocco and Tunisia. eased tensions in the Soviet Union, thousands of Russian Jews streamed into Israel, more than 700,000 by 1996. Yet thousands of Jews remained trapped by regimes intent on preventing their leaving. Their journey to freedom was an escape from oppressive anti-Semitism. Their struggle to survive had been a tenacious determination to remain true to their Jewish faith and culture in a world intent on erasing both. Private letters written in the 1980s by some of the Jews in Leningrad, together with their own secretly filmed home movies, chronicle that struggle and reveal the depth of Russian Jewish yearning to return to the land of their biblical ancestors. Here is some of what they wrote. We hunted for any piece of information about Jewry we could find. We secretly duplicated what we got on typewriters or with a camera. We had no copy machines. Duplication of non-official papers was dangerous. In spite of the risk, we printed Jewish histories, a Hebrew manual, a chapter from the Torah. All night through we would work. These books opened us to an unknown world. There was a renaissance, partly connected with a national sense of Jews who wanted to be a part of their own land. They weren't learning Hebrew to talk it in the streets of Leningrad. They were learning Hebrew to talk it in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And partly the, the sense that here were Jews who'd been cut off, they, their parents, even their grandparents, from Jewish life, Jewish activity, Jewish thought, Jewish literature, and they were coming back to it. We gathered secretly wherever we could. We met in yards and apartments with extra exits in case of danger and we had to flee. It worked, but not always. Some of us lost our jobs. Many of us were kicked out of schools or called up to the army or arrested or put in prison. Sometimes our children were taken from us in militia roundups. In the summer, we would go for picnics with our children to the country. There we could listen to lectures or sing Jewish songs. Our children could play with other Jewish children. We could all study Hebrew. It was safer in the countryside. Mass media did its best to compare Jews with Hitler fascists. We were constantly facing a barrage of hatred and lies that we had no way of fighting. We have been encouraged to see young Russian Jews returning to the faith of their fathers, joining old men in their prayers. For our children, Judaism has become a home right from the start. Hebrew had a special place in our studies. Those who came to our classes were drawn into their Jewish life. But Hebrew classes and their teachers became the main target for the Soviet government's repressions anti-Semitism was again rising in Russia. Little did we know then that soon, very soon, 
we would be able to leave for Israel at last. I'm meeting a young Ethiopian soldier from the Israeli Defense Forces. Major Miki Achiron is another of those who braved a difficult journey to come to this country. In 1984, some 7,000 Ethiopian Jews walked hundreds of miles across the open desert to reach a secret rendezvous known as Operation Moses. Yet you kept on going. Why didn't you turn back? Whether we died or not, we won't come to Israel. You know, when you tell the story, it sounds like more than a, a piece of factual modern history. It sounds like something out of the Bible. היהודים מכל העולם, מכל הצבעים, זהו נס. נס אה, שבאמת מחזיק אותה לאורך שנים, למרות שמדינה קטנה, אבל מה שיש בתוך המדינה הזאת הוא It's something special. Every day when I wear these stuffs, I feel proud. In a second effort to rescue the Jews of Ethiopia called Operation Solomon, dramatic airlift secretly negotiated with their government, 15,000 Jews, almost all of those remaining in Ethiopia, were airlifted to Israel on 41 flights carried out in less than 30 hours in May 1991. At great risk had their departure been detected by those who opposed their escape. I grew up with one dream, not to get education, not to be doctor, not to be lawyer, just one dream, to get to Jerusalem one day, Yerden Fanta was barely 12 years old when her family determined to escape the anti-Jewish repression of Ethiopia. They had long dreamed of building a new life in Israel, a place where they could openly celebrate their Jewish heritage. After one year in the desert, finally uh, came afternoon, uh, three buses to pick us, uh, some people to the airport. We were so excited, exhausted, and, and tired and just we couldn't understand it's gonna happen and we came to Israel. Sometimes you have a dream to touch the sky and you touch it and you don't understand how it happened. We just, you know, looking around and and you can't believe it that it's happened. Beit HaTvutzot, the Museum of the Jewish Diaspora on the campus of Tel Aviv University, is dedicated to the saga of 2,000 years of Jewish life in exile from their homeland from 70 AD to 1948. Marilyn Hilkowitz is a guide at the museum. It was a time of, of great pain for the Jewish soul and a time of glory, a time of growth, a time of, of doing wonderful things and, and surviving, surviving against tremendous odds and tremendous hostility. And there were other times, there was the golden age of Spain, which um, was a time of poetry and philosophy and religiosity and, and medicine and science. There have been wonderful times People don't expect the wonderful times. We all expect just the sad and the hostility and the, the, the awfulness of, of the 2,000 years. The ability to, to rise above the nastiness of everyday living and express ourselves and, and let our Jewish souls soar 
that is what's so wonderful and so special. I think that it's a miracle that all these people made it to Israel. You say a miracle, what do you mean by that? I guess everybody has to, has to decide for themselves what constitutes a miracle. Just the, to stand on the campus of Tel Aviv University, to, to go to the Israel Philharmonic, to sit in this marvelous auditorium and to hear them play Hatikva. Those are miracles. This is the dichotomy I keep running up against with almost every person I talk to here in Israel. One tells me we're here because we're strong and we're smart and we are determined and another tells me we're here because this was God's plan all along and we're just fulfilling the prophecies. Which is it? It's definitely a, a, a coalescing of both these, both these different strengths the one of belief and the one of courage because the two come together and create the state of Israel as we have it. I'm working on this series of reports from Israel and trying to understand what this country is all about and I think on a certain level maybe I'm also trying to find out what I'm all about as mm -hmm. a Jew and I want you just to be my guide for a second and tell me where should I look for the answer. I don't know that you'll ever find it but what is important is that you're looking. Just keep looking. Just keep looking. You'll find, if you find it, you'll find it. If you don't, just the search is worthwhile. Rabbi Israel Lau, former chief rabbi of Israel and present chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, was an orphaned child of the Holocaust when he came to Israel before the nation was even born. If there wouldn't be a promise from the Almighty to our ancient fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we wouldn't dream 2,000 years to come back home. We wouldn't fight for it. We wouldn't be ready to sacrifice so many sacrificings to come back and with a feeling that the prophecy of Jeremiah, chapter 31, Veshavu Banim Ligvulam, the children will return back to their homes, that they will be, this will be fulfilled in our very eyes. We are now here. 104 different communities all over the world and gathered in Israel. Isaiah, the prophet, speaking about in gathering of exiles, and he spoke about it 2,500 years ago. And he said, I see them. I see them in my spiritual eyes coming like the clouds and like the doves to their nests. Why does the prophet need two examples for a gathering of exiles? There is a main difference between a cloud and a dove. A cloud has no emotions, has no wisdom, no initiative. A cloud is pushed by a wind. Without the wind, the cloud will not move. The dove is have homesick to her couple, to her children, to her nest, to her home. I see in my spiritual eyes, said the prophet, two kinds of coming to Israel, new comers, Olim Chadashim. Those who will be pushed here by storm winds of pogroms, anti-Semitism, exiles, expel, and Holocaust. And I see those who will come here like the doves with emotion and feelings and sentiments that we go home, this is our home, we want to be there. I was eight years old when I was liberated in the concentration camp of the Nazis Buchenwald. I came here like the cloud pushed by the storm wind of Holocaust. Jewishness is a mixture of past, present and future. Without being based on the past, there wouldn't be the present who would speak about future. You cannot create a new nation just by saying a word, we are not Jewish, we are Israelis. It's the same. Kahol velavan. Kahol velavan. Ze tseva sheli. Ze tseva sheli.
They may look different, speak different languages, come from different cultures and places, but they all have the same dream, to be part of the family that is Israel. Hebrew classes are a necessary part of that, at least if you ever intend on reading a newspaper or a magazine, watching the news, going to the market, or paying your bills. These people are learning the language of the Bible, the language of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Jesus and his disciples. Intelligent people giving up their own language to learn one that hasn't been spoken in public in 2,000 years. If I did believe in miracles, I'd say this is one of the biggest. If miracles have names, this one should have the name Eliezer ben Yehuda. A Lithuanian Jew, ben Yehuda was just 12 years old when he had what he described as a vision. He said light flashed across the sky and a voice spoke three times the words, the land and the language. Somehow he understood his vision to be a life's calling for him to restore Hebrew to a common language in the land of the Bible. But as he grew to manhood in Moscow, he was caught up in the secularism of his day, eventually forsaking much of his Jewish faith and traditions. Graduating at the top of his class, he traveled to Paris with a scholarship to study medicine. Contracting tuberculosis, he was unable to continue his studies. Befriended by Baron Rothschild, who sponsored treatments for his recovery in Algiers, again one afternoon Ben Yehuda heard the call, the land and the language. Baron Rothschild agreed to fund Ben Yehuda's efforts. Despite his worsening tuberculosis, Ben Yehuda moved to Jerusalem. He raised his children to know only Hebrew, made it the only language spoken in his home, published a newspaper in Hebrew, taught it as a spoken language in the school where he was employed. His crowning achievement was the 17 volumes of the Ben Yehuda Dictionary Lexicon that became the guidebook for transforming an ancient tongue into a 20th century language. The miracle is that he stayed with it despite severe persecution, ridicule, the stoning of his son, the tragic loss of his wife. One month before he died in 1922, the British colonial government officially recognized Hebrew as the language of Palestinian Jews. Eliezer ben Yehuda had fulfilled his role in preparing for the miracle of Israel's rebirth on the 20th century world stage. Dr. Mary Bat Moshe is director of the Hebrew Language Academy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. We met in the Ben Yehuda Library. It must have been an incredible undertaking for this man, Eliezer ben Yehuda, to do whatever he had to do to make this language usable today. What was involved, in broad terms anyway? What did he have to do? ארץ ישראל, בארצו של העם היהודי, צריך לדבר בלשונו של העם היהודי. אליעזר בן יהודה סבל הרבה מאוד גם בגלל השיגעון הזה שלו, אבל הוא היה נחוש וחולל ב- עם שאר המחוללים את הנס הגדול הזה של תחיית העברית. יש נס גדול בכך שאתה לוקח שפה. שהתמקדה והקצתה לעצמה פינה בהוויה של האדם, כלומר בחיים הליטורגיים שלו, בבית המדרש, בלמידה, בתפילה. לחלץ אותה מהפינה הזו, הקדושה, הטהורה, המסויגת, ולהביא אותה אל כיכר השוק. להביא אותה אל חדר המיטות, להביא אותה אל המטבח. אלה הם דברים שהם בפירוש בגדר נס. תקומת עם ישראל בארצו, לרבות הלשון העברית, מסמנת או אה, תוחמת את העם היהודי כעם ככל העמים. The wealth of Israel, its true gold, is in the heart and soul of its people. Men and women of faith and purpose, who see themselves as part of the miracle of modern Israel, the people who understand that they're inseparably linked to the legacy and faith of Joshua, Jonathan, and David. Is there a miracle in all this? If you're looking for a spectacular demonstration of supernatural phenomena, you'll probably say no. But if you look deeper, into the hearts of millions of people from scores of nations on every continent, 
who found themselves strangely drawn to a land they had never known, who left behind everyone and everything familiar to come here of their own choosing, to restart their lives, living, working, and raising their families in a barren wasteland, offering only sacrifice, toil, and the constant threat of annihilation, to give up the language of their birth and learn Hebrew, to be willing on a daily basis to face threats to their very survival, and yet manage to build one of the most successful, most productive nations on Earth. It's hard to find any logical answer to explain all this. A miracle? You decide. <laughs>